Hello, this is Michael Edwards, CEO at BioInfo Solutions. This video is part one in a series I'll be doing on crowdsourcing coronavirus data. Uh, I also want to announce that all the data sets that we'll be using and presenting on in these series of videos will be free and available to the public. Uh, so please check out the description of this video and you should find a link to my GitHub account where you can download and access all the associated files. Uh, I know I share this sentiment with a lot of my friends and colleagues in science, but when something like the COVID-19 epidemic happens, you feel powerless and you want to help. Uh, it's my hope that by gathering hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of coronavirus research data together in one place and some of the biological insights that we've been able to gain from looking at that, uh, that it might help benefit maybe a researcher or clinician on the front line of this epidemic. This next slide is just an outline of some of the topics I'll be discussing in the next couple of videos. Uh, to start off with, I'm going to give you some background on SARS-CoV-2, uh, how it infects its target cell, and what are some of the cellular responses to that infection. Uh, I will also give you the rationale for why we used a related strain of virus, SARS-CoV, as a surrogate for infection for the current epidemic. Uh, I will then explain how we use the Illumina platform base space correlation engine to collect gene expression data from multiple animal studies looking at the host response to SARS-CoV in the lung. Uh, I will also show how we can combine all of this information to generate a single gene expression profile at different time points post-infection that we can probe for biological insight and even therapeutic intervention. And finally, I will explain the metadata files associated with this analysis that are available for public download, which you can use to further your own research or follow along with these videos. Before I get into the meat of my talk, a few disclaimers and disclosures. Uh, basically, all this is saying is that everything you're hearing that's coming out of my mouth is all me and doesn't represent anybody else and that no one's paid me to do these videos, although I have received plenty of technical help from the individuals that are listed on my title slide. This first figure shows the life cycle of the SARS-CoV-2 infecting its host cell. It is believed that the virus binds to cells containing the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, or ACE2 receptor. A list of tissues ranked by the amount of ACE2 gene expression is given here on the right. I find it interesting that ACE2 gene expression levels in the lung are very, very low compared to other tissues, having some researchers actually speculate alternative receptors for viral binding. Uh, once we start digging into the data, we actually might have evidence that this is true. Upon viral binding to its receptor, um, it causes a conformational change in the viral protein, which facilitates viral envelope fusion uh, with the cell membrane through the endosomal pathway. Uh, the virus then releases its RNA into the host cell. This genome RNA is translated into viral replicase polyproteins PP1A and 1AB, which are then cleaved into small products by viral proteinases. The polymerase produces a series of subgenomic mRNAs by discontinuous transcription and finally, finally translated into relevant viral proteins. These viral proteins and genome RNA are then subsequently assembled into virons in the ER and in the Golgi, uh, which are then transported via vesicles and released out of the cell where they can go and infect other cells with ACE2 receptors. As you can well imagine, the host cell doesn't take this viral invasion lying down. Primary inflammatory responses occur very early after viral infection, primarily initiated by the innate immune system. These responses are mainly driven by active viral replication, viral mediated ACE2 downregulation and shedding, um, and also a host of antiviral responses, which can lead to increased cytokine and chemokine production, and cellular damage through apoptosis, which is also known as programmed cell death, and or pyroptosis, which is a cell death that results in elevated inflammation in the surrounding tissues. SARS-CoV-2 infection also causes increased secretion of the inflammatory molecules interleukin-1b, interferon gamma, IP10, MCP1, interleukin-4, and interleukin-10. 
Most patients can tolerate primary inflammatory responses at the stage of infection with a positive outcome of viral load reduction or even viral clearance, followed by receding of inflammation. Secondary inflammation responses begin with the generation of adaptive immunity and the appearance of neutralizing antibodies that further diminish viral replication. However, the appearance of these antibodies can trigger immune cells that recognize the, this viral-bound antibody complex and can cause severe lung injury from aggressive inflammation. It is this uncontrolled pulmonary inflammation that is likely the cause of fatality in SARS-CoV-2 infection. Consistent with a possible inflammatory storm associated with disease severity, ICU patients with severe disease had higher plasma levels of inflammatory markers interleukin-2, interleukin-7, interleukin-10, GCSF, IP10, MCP1, MIP1A, and TNF-alpha. It is hoped that by investigating the way the host cells respond to this virus, we can identify or at least develop therapeutics that can either boost the body's defenses against the virus or inhibit the aggressive immune system that is re responsible for so much tissue damage that can lead to the death of the infected individual. A list of antiviral agents proposed for use against the SARS virus shortly after the 2002-2003 pandemic is given in this table. You'll notice that most of the proposed compounds act directly against the infecting of virus, although this can be tough given the virus's ability to mutate and evade pharmacological intervention. There have been efforts to boost the body's own immune system, as with giving patients different forms of interferon as shown here. That could help clear the virus or inhibit further infection, but this has been met with limited effectiveness. As far as I know, none of the compounds listed in this table are being widely used to treat the current epidemic, necessitating the development of new therapeutics and ways to attack the infection. Again, the more we know about the virus and how it causes its host to respond to the infection, the more likely we'll be able to boost cellular defense mechanisms that are inhibited by the virus and quell aggressive immune responses that lead to tissue damage. Unfortunately, there is little to no host response data in the public domain on the current strain of SARS-CoV-2 because it's so new. So we looked for a related strain we could use as a surrogate to try to understand the host response to infection. There are seven known types of coronavirus that affect humans. All types cause upper respiratory symptoms like sneezing and coughing and may even cause fever. Most types of coronavirus are relatively harmless, like the common cold. The three strains given at the top, SARS-CoV, MERS-CoV, and the current strain, SARS-CoV-2, produce more severe symptoms than the other types of coronavirus and have been responsible for viral pandemics. All of these viruses are similar at the genetic level, but the CoV and the CoV-2 strains show the most homology at 79%. These two strains also have a common animal host in bats, target the same ACE2 receptor on the cell for viral entry, and produce similar symptoms in the infected individual. It should also be noted that the SARS-CoV strain is more lethal than the SARS-CoV-2 one, but less severe than the MERS form. It is because of these similarities that we decided to use studies looking at the host response to SARS-CoV in our meta-analysis to try to understand the current epidemic. In the next series of videos, I will demonstrate how we used Illumina's base space correlation engine, which is shown here, to collect metadata on the host response to SARS-CoV. I will also discuss how we can combine these studies into a single host response infection signature that we can then use to understand the current epidemic. As always, please subscribe to my YouTube channel to be notified when the next video in the series gets posted. Thanks again for your attention, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care and stay safe.